Hi, okay. So, you know, the kid comes up to me and uh, there are issues related to academic problems. Then we look at it in two or three perspectives. First of all, we look at the capacity of the child. So, if a kid is uh, intellectually good, then we look at it in terms of one perspective. If the kid has a problem with his intellect, then we look at it in terms of another. To get an idea as to how uh, good he is intellectually, one normally does tests, which are called IQ tests. Now, these IQ tests are not sacrosanct, but they certainly give us an idea as to how the kid is, how he's performing, what we should expect from him, and so on. A lot of kids have good intellect, but because of the fact they have a problem with attention, they may not be able to focus very well, and because they're not able to focus very well, they're not able to study very well, and because they can't study very well, they cannot reproduce at the time of the exams. So this is something called attention. We have to go on to check and see how the kid's attention span is. Which is. And if he doesn't have a good attention span, then we call it attention deficit disorder. Again, to diagnose this, in addition to the clinical stuff that we see in a one-to-one -one, uh, interview, we also do some scales. So the scales would be the, the, the questionnaires, which are sent either to the mother, to the parents, or to the school, or to the tuition teacher, and other uh, important people who are in the person's vicinity. If the child has an attentional problem, then it is imperative that that attentional problem also has to be dealt with. Now, supposing the kid has good intellect, doesn't have an intellect, doesn't have an attentional problem, but is still having issues with academics, then we start looking at the possibility of his also having some kind of a learning disability. Now, there are various kinds of learning disabilities, but for the sake of some amount of uh, explanation, you might have a problem with the word. So you have a problem with reading or you have a problem with spellings. You might have a problem with math or you might have a problem in that you're very good verbally but when I ask you to write the same thing you have a problem and you have a problem in writing it. So the first which is the word issue we normally call dyslexia. The second which is the math issue we normally call dyscalculia. And the third is the writing thing which we normally call dysgraphia. There are a whole bunch of other things also associated, but this is what we normally look at. And it's very simplistic the way I've said it. The test to diagnose it would take about two, three, four, five, six hours. We have to also exclude the normal issues related to a auditory or a, a visual handicap. Supposing all of this has been diagnosed and it's been, has been eliminated and we find that none of these exist, then it might be a good idea to also look at issues related to his mood, issues related to his emotion. So a kid who is, for example, extremely depressed or anxious would find that these emotions come in the way of his, able to, of his being able to concentrate, of his being able to study. And then we deal with it more in terms of the emotional aspect rather than the intellectual one. If the kid is being sexually abused, physically abused, emotionally he's traumatized because of something else, that is again something that's likely to come in the way of his being able to study well. And this becomes an issue that also needs to be dealt with. So overall, when a kid doesn't do well, we don't look at it as he doesn't like the teacher or he doesn't like the subject, though that might be true. We look at it in terms of all these other perspectives. And when each of them has been uh, diagnosed or eliminated, then we start the treatment of what has to be done and usually there's a very good response. You know, one of the things that I've often been asked is what role does a psychiatrist actually play when we are dealing with a kid who has a learning problem? So we normally work in a team. Of course, if I want to do IQ tests, I would not be able to do it. I would send to a psychologist who would do them. If I need some scales for attention deficit, if I need to do other scales, I could do them, but I would often authenticated with another psychologist and so on. But the most important issue related to what a psychiatrist is supposed to do actually revolves around the fact that we have an overall idea as to brain structure, we have an overall idea as to the electronic circuits in the brain, we have an overall idea as to what exactly is happening within the child's head to make him react in a particular way. And dependent on what we feel is happening and dependent on what we think is the cause of his behavior or his not being able to perform in a particular way, we may or may not advise the use of medication. In addition to the behavior medication, behavior modification techniques or the other therapies that are often indicated, 
it is at times essential that medication has to be given and that medication has to be given under the supervision of a psychiatrist who knows what he's doing. We have a whole bunch of myths associated with medication. The child is going to become a zombie, the child is going to sleep too much, the child will put on a lot of weight, the child will do this, that and the other. And all of that is nonsense. What we need to do is to be aware of the fact that yes, uh, a tablet may have side effects, go back to the doctor and he will assure that the side effects are taken care of. So for example, if the child is a little sleepy because of this, he will be given medication in such a way that he will not have sleep in the future. We are not nitwits. We are not going to land up causing more problems to the child than what he already has. But it is a terrible thing, it is a terrible indictment of a society if we start saying that because the medication is so bad and because psychiatrists have psychiatry has such a funny name, the child is going to land up having more of a problem than if he had not seen the psychiatrist. This is really not true. You may have as an adult a whole bunch of myths, you may have a whole bunch of misgivings and of course Dr. Google is always there which causes so much of a problem but what we need to do is to be aware of the fact that technically Dr. Google is about 10 to 12 years old and most of us senior people have been in the field since very long. So what we need to do is to be aware of the fact that medication given especially in conditions like attention deficit disorder will make all the difference in the world. They will enable the child to study, they will enable him to concentrate, they will enable him to reproduce. He will start doing better in his exams. His feelings of self-worth will improve and who can want more than that. So often we've had parents who've been very diffident about starting medication. I mean, they procrastinate, they prolong it, they come back after three months, six months, and then when they start, they come back and they say, oh my God, I wish we had done this before. So let not your own uh, diffidence about medication which is not based on reality come in the way of allowing your child to do well especially if he has something like an attention deficit disorder. Let's also look at it in terms of the emotional problems he might have. Every emotional problem may not need medication but there are lots of medic uh, emotional problems especially if you're so severely depressed that you're suicidal. You do not have a choice you have to put the kid on medication. A lot of people come in and say can I do yoga can I do meditation yes that's fine but if you've broken your hand, if you have a fracture somewhere, am I going to tell you to go and do yoga? No, I'm not. I'm going to tell you to get on and go for an operation or see an orthopedic surgeon, get some plastering done, get some plates put in, whatever else. The orthopedician thinks is the right thing to do. So go to a psychiatrist and follow what the psychiatrist says is the right thing to do. Not what mummy, daddy, uncle, auntie or some other, they, because everybody says they say so. Do not allow that to come in the way of proper treatment for your child. That is almost a variation of child abuse. Now one of the things that often happens is when parents come up to me because their kids are not doing well or because their kids have some issues, they get very scared and they don't really know how to react. So let's talk about a few things. Number one, except in a few conditions you are not responsible for the child's attention deficit disorder, for the child having depression and things like that. Yes, if the environment is terrible, it might have an additive effect. But by and large, the focus is today more on electronic circuits in the brain, more in terms of uh, genetic issues, more in terms of actual brain structure, more in terms of some amount of neurotransmitter issues. This whole old concept of the bad mother and the cold father is no longer valid. It was nice when it lasted but today we no longer talk of that at all. So do not hold yourself guilty if your child has attention deficit disorder. Do not believe that it's because of what you did or didn't do that has caused this problem. It is essential for us to realize that almost if not everything that happens to the kid today or happens to the adult today is related to some area of the brain which is having an issue. And you are not responsible for that area of the brain which is having an issue. That's point number one. Point number two. Sometimes when a kid has a problem, we tend to overreact and sometimes we tend to underreact. So let's talk about the underreaction first. If you get into denial and say, oh, everything is okay, he'll outgrow it, that is being stupid. There may be some things he's outgrowing, he will outgrow, but it is essential for you to take him for a proper evaluation to a mental health professional, preferably a psychiatrist, who will be able to tell you whether he thinks that this is just a stage of growing up 
or whether some early intervention measure is an absolute must. We do know that the earlier the situation is dealt with, the better overall will be the results. And there's absolutely no reason for you, especially if you have access to a good psychiatrist, to be able to get the best treatment that is possible for your child as early as is possible for the child. So that is when you're a little diffident about going. Supposing you actually go to the person, to the doctor, which you should be doing. Get out of this whole thing of myths related to, oh my God, what will the world say? Will it mean that I'm a bad mother? Will it mean that I'm a bad father? Does it mean that the child is going to you know, get affected by it? That's all nonsense. Once again, supposing you had, say, a heart problem, you'd go to a cardiologist. If you had asthma, you'd go to an asthma specialist. If you are having problems relating to emotionality or attention, you should go to a psychiatrist and figure out what can be done to reduce the effects of whatever he's experiencing, to gain the disease, to gain control over the disease, and to ensure that the kid grows up living a very good life. It's, we all know that the younger you catch the child, the more effective is the treatment. And provided you're under supervision of a doctor who is a psychiatrist, uh, the results are going to be very, very good. Point number four, it is essential for us to be sensible about what we are looking at. If results, for example, show that intellectual capacity is not very good, do not expect that he's going to do brilliantly, but do expect that with all the support that you can give your child, uh, the child will do as well as he is capable of doing. And that is something that we should look at. We should expect the child to do as well as he is capable of doing. Do not expect miracles. There's no Santa Claus really in life. One more aspect. It is also essential for us to believe that the doctor who we are in, who we are, we are going to, knows what he's talking about. Sometimes we get into this, my mother said this and my grandmother said this and the neighbors are saying this. I have no doubt that in India we have a whole bunch of people who know better than everybody else about what we should be doing with our kids. They're never going to be having the experiences that you have. They're never going to be in the shoes of a little kid who has a problem. It is essential then to go to a mental health professional who knows what the whole scenario is about and not to bother about too much about what, they are, what the parent is saying or the other people are saying. It is essential for us to follow the dictates of the mental health professional. Yes, there may be times when you feel you're not happy with what is happening, get a second opinion. But the second opinion should again be from a mental health professional, from a psychiatrist. It should not with all due respect to them, be from somebody who's maybe a counsellor or maybe a, you know, a, a yoga specialist or a meditation specialist. They all play a very, very important role. But overall, the person who knows the most about the structures of the brain is actually the psychiatrist. It's like saying, like I've said once in the past, if you have a fracture, you're not going to go to a physiotherapist, even though physiotherapy is very, very important later on. You're going to go to an orthopedic surgeon. And the same holds good for, for diseases associated with children. Finally, what else are we supposed to do? Physical punishment is an absolute no-no. So the physical, so the parent should not indulge in physical punishment even when he or she loses her temper or is frustrated at what he or she sees is something that the child is doing on purpose. We should be as verbally positive as possible. We should be as little uh, abuser as we can be, even verbally, I mean physically the question doesn't even arise, but as far as possible, we should attempt to be as verbally positive as we can be, so that the child feels a feeling of comfort and support, which will then help him coast through the problems that he might be actually facing in the real bad world. We must remember that we have to be as positive as possible, so the child goes out feeling that even if the world is very negativistic and very bad with him, at least he has his parents to fall back on and they will support him where it is needed.